Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you. Very thankful for the good number who is out. If you would, please turn to John 19. John 19, I want to consider a thought with you from that text. I want to thank the men for the exceptional job they've done in leading us in worship this morning and the good efforts put forth. I've never been in a service where I wanted the Lord's Supper to keep on going. I really appreciate the good thoughts that our brother had to share with us. It would have been better if he was more passionate about it. It was kind of boring, but it was uh, still pretty good. He got the point across. Very good, very good thoughts on that. Never considered those before. But it is a blessing to have you, friends. Very thankful for those who are visiting. And I don't mind to tell you that my personal goal is for you to leave here having experienced a group of people that is abounding in love for one another and for others, as even our verse pointed out this morning, and that our God is glorified in all that we do. That's a noble goal. But that we all leave here with a greater appreciation for Jesus. And that's what I want to develop in this thought this morning. When he goes back to when Jesus was on the cross... And there are seven statements recorded while he was on the cross. And the last two are mentioned here in John 19, and especially his final statement of it being finished. But notice with me in John chapter 19 and verse 25 beginning, that there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother... And the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when he had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And so we see there were several things he stated here. And as I'm reading them, obviously I'm reading them in a more controlled and relaxed manner, saying them in a much easier manner than he did while on the cross because he's, he's, he's near death. His voice is weak. His body is weak. He's parched. He's thirsty, and these words are just being being basically whispered out where it's hard for people to hear. But the point I want us to see, especially as our Savior is there on the cross, is what he does say in verse 31. The very last words he utters before he leaves this life is, it is finished. Now what in the world did he mean by that? Because if you just keep looking at the story of the Bible, not everything regarding the plan of Christ was complete. There was still more to come. I mean, even if you keep just looking at what else would be said, yes, there was a lot already finished of God being manifested in the flesh and of Jesus, of course, dying for sin, as we are looking at. But he would come back from the dead. And he would still send his spirit. He would still establish his kingdom in Acts chapter 2 in the development of the church. He would still have his word taught throughout the world, which was not done until years later when Paul said that in Colossians 1.23. And then we have things that are still yet to be determined in terms of our final resurrection when all souls are brought forth. Or the day of judgment that he talked about in Matthew 25. That hasn't happened yet. And then, of course, when he delivers the kingdom to the Father, as it's described in 1 Corinthians 15, there's still more yet to come, especially in regard to the will of God. So what did he mean? As he is there on the cross and he's given it up, he says, it's over, it's done, we did it, it's finished. What could he possibly have in mind? And I would suggest to us that even that little phrase, if we look at what it may refer to, and most likely refers to, 
that it can help us. It can help us in our faith. It can help us in our walk with him. It can help us in our relationship with him. And I can tell you, and I hope this is true for you next time, because it was still very meaningful for all of us, I'm sure, this morning in taking the Lord's Supper. But I can tell you, having looked at these things that I'm going to share with you, it was a little bit more emotional for me this morning taking the Lord's Supper, so mindful of what Jesus meant when he said it's finished. So what did our Savior mean? Well, I believe it's safe to say that one thing that was finished was his suffering on the cross. Because that's the very last statement he said before he died. And that Jesus had endured a tremendous death. And our brother's exactly right. It was not spilled. He shed his blood for us. And this goes back way before the nails got to his wrist and his feet. Jesus is suffering for us. In John chapter 19, it says in verse 1 that Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Yeah, so he just scourged him, and then we just keep on reading. He scourged him. Let me tell you, six out of ten people did not survive scourging. It's a big thing. It's a real big thing. That they took him and scourged him, that is huge. That's tremendous. That if he would have just done that for us, it would have been tremendous. Just that. The act of giving up his body like that. And listen, when we take that bread, we're to think of that body that was given. Take and eat. This is my body that he says. And what he means by that is you remember the suffering I endured to give you salvation because I do love you. Yes, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But listen, that son loves us just as much. And he gave himself so that we can be set free from sin. I found a really good explanation of scourging. Now, I can't read all of it, especially publicly at least, because it's just too gruesome. But it's something that I came across that I think is really good. In the chronological life of Christ, and the last name of the man is Moore... And here's what he said. Flogging was such a horrible punishment that it was illegal to flog Roman citizens without a direct edict from Caesar. The victim was tied to a post or hung from a wall. Either method drew the muscles taut across the victim's back. The soldier would then use a flagellum, also called a cat of nine tails. It was a short wooden stick with nine thong strands attached to it. At the end of each strand was tied something sharp, a bone, metal, glass, or metal balls. The purpose was not to lash out quickly so as to inflict welts. Rather, the soldier would attempt to rake the vic victim's back with the sharp objects. The Jews limited the lashes to 39. The Romans, however, were hindered only by their animosity and endurance. And then he gets into some details I just can't read. But then he goes on to say, Often the tails would rip around the victim's face, gouging out his eyes. It is not surprising then that flogging alone was lethal about six out of ten times. Those what survived were usually carried out on a stretcher with permanent mutilation. That's what's in there. When it says that Pilate took Jesus and scourged, that's, that's what we're talking about. And we have to understand that this was a very bloody scene when he was scourged. Even before we got to the nails, which is again horrendous. The Bible says that being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2 and verse 8. Our Savior was being handled by people who hated Him or hated Jews. He was being handled by people who were ravaging His body. And He endured this so that you and I might have the hope past sin. Now, I, I cannot see this movie anymore. I don't intend to, at least. But in 2004, you remember when The Passion of Christ came out, and it is 
It's gory. I just can't handle it. The scene of the scourging, the scene of the crucifixion, it was just too much. And it really does need to be a, a movie that only older people see because it's just too much. And I don't know how accurate all that movie is, but I think they got us really close when it comes to that scene, that tremendously bloody scene of what Jesus did for us. And then it doesn't stop there. Jesus gave himself and that he allowed them to twist this crown of thorns upon his head. I wish I had my camera with me yesterday, but I was in our back property yesterday and I saw some thorns on around this tree. And I'm not kidding you, the, the thorns were as, like that big, several inches big, just wrapped around this tree. I have to bring it in sometime to, to show you that. Do you think they delicately placed that thorn thorny crown on his head. And when they got this crown together, you think they just tenderly just put it there so making sure our Savior didn't hurt anymore? You know better. They ground that thing into his skull. And the reason they were doing this was to mock him, this great, tremendous king. Let us praise this king. Give him a crown. Give him a robe. And they did that. They put this robe on him and they struck him. Now keep in mind, when they put this robe on him, his back was not as smooth and clean as yours. It's lacerated. It's wet. It's bloody. And they're putting this thing on him. And they did not leave it there. They ripped it off later as they're continuing to mock our Savior. And as if that was not enough, they spat on him. Now, if I were to come up to you right now and spit on you, you would be deeply offended. It would be, it would be enough. It's, these things would come out most likely if I came and spat on you. Something would happen. You wouldn't put up with that. But Jesus was allowing his creation to do this to him. And it says, of course, that as they were doing this, they were mocking him. Why would he do this? Why would he endure such hostility and such humiliation? It's bad enough he's dying for a, a crime he didn't commit, but then for people to laugh at him while he's dying. Tremendous what our Savior did for us. It says, they clothed him with purple, they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to be crucified. Like our brother said in the Lord's Supper, let us never forget that he does love us. He really does. I mean, how can you possibly read this and think of this and walk away with the question of whether or not God loves us and whether or not Jesus loves us. But see, that's what he's most likely thinking of. When he says, before he dies, it's finished, I think it's going back to this type of activity, of his suffering for sin like this. But it can also include something else that is very important to our relationship with him, and that is our redemption from sin was now finished. In Mark chapter 15, if you look in verses 33 through 36, the Bible is showing us how God wants us to realize the tremendous sacrifice made that day. In verse 33, it says that the sixth hour had come and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now, it's about noon, right? So the sixth hour is noon and it's lasting to the ninth hour, so we're looking to about 3 p.m., and it says there's darkness over the whole earth. Some have wondered, is it just that location that they had darkness, or was it globally, or at least around the world this time? And it does say uh, the, whole, the whole land until the ninth hour. But does it really matter? Either way, you have the, the peak time of day for the sun to be exposed, and yet it's dark from noon to three, completely dark. And it's illustrating something, this darkness is. Because as this is happening, it says in verse 34, and at that hour, the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. And then, of course, it talked about him breathing his last. So what's happening here? I mean, right now, if it just got dark right now, as I'm in the middle of this lesson, you would be concerned. And if it lasted for several hours, we would all be very concerned. What's happening here? Why is it so dark in the middle of the day? And there's a good reason for that. And there's a good reason why he said what he said in this text. He's going back to Psalm 22, and that's what he's quoting and in Psalm 22, he is actually reading, or at least uh, re repeating what is read here. In Psalm 22 and verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what's happening? Well, what's happening is that now Jesus has become sin for us, is what this means. That he became a sin sacrifice. And for the first time in his relationship with his father, that he was spiritually separated. Like when you and I sin, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That we, 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 God hides his face from us when we sin. We drive this separation in our relationship with him. For the first time in their existence, now Jesus is separated. He becomes sin and he is spiritually severed from his father and becomes that sinful sacrifice. To pay the debt of sin. And to illustrate just how painful this is to his father as well as to himself. And just how great this moment is. Nature even stopped and showed darkness. To demonstrate just exactly what is happening. And that's a tremendous sacrifice. And what we see in Psalm 22 is Jesus knew this going in, in, into his experience as a man. If you keep reading in Psalm 22, as Jesus quotes from this psalm, in verse 14 through verse 18, it says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and my clothing they cast lot. That's not accidental. And he quotes from this psalm as he's dying. My God, my God, why have you forsaken? That's not an accident. Because this psalm was predicting this. It was foretelling what Jesus would go through. And here's what's so striking about that. He says that they have pierced my hands and my feet in verse 16. Do you realize it would still be another 600 years before the act of crucifixion was even introduced to humanity? At this time, when Psalm 22 was written, when a Jew wanted to or punish and execute another Jew, how were they killed? is with stoning, right? That's what the law said. They were to stone those who were worthy of death. The idea of killing somebody by piercing their hands and their feet had not even been introduced to humanity. And yet it's being foretold in Psalm 22. And what should really cause us to pause is that Jesus knew this. He knew this a thousand years before he came to this earth. He knew what type of death he would experience for us. And he still came. He still came and he still endured all that was expected of him in preparing himself for the sacrifice. My word, what a savior we have. And again, to show just how significant this scene was, it says that after Jesus died in Mark chapter 15, something else took place to illustrate that man's sins have been Redeemed, that this opportunity to be set free from sin is now available. In Mark chapter 15, notice where it says in verses 37 through 39, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. 
Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, think of this. This veil, which was the veil that separated the Holy of Holies to the, the holy place within the temple, was a massive curtain. I mean, this was a massive veil. I read that it was 30 feet high and 60 feet wide and about as thick as a man's hand. Massive curtain, 30 feet high, 60 feet wide. I'm not entirely sure how tall this room is, but 30 feet. Big curtain. And very few in life ever saw this. Only the priests saw this. And only one person went beyond it once a year, and that was the high priest. Nobody went beyond that curtain. And yet when Jesus died, as we just read, that when he breathed his last, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out his last breath, said, truly this man was the Son of God. What's happening there? What's happening is God is also illustrating, yes, I've just been separated from my son. Darkness shows that. Never had that before. But now God is illustrating that now something special has happened because of Jesus breathing his last. Now all men have the opportunity to go behind the veil, behind the curtain, into heaven itself because of what Jesus did on the cross. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says in verse 19 that that's exactly how Jesus is our forerunner. He went behind the curtain. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19, the Bible says that the, this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. He can do that because he provided us with the remission of sins. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says in verses 13 through 15, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the pure and up fine of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason... He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So that's why that curtain was torn. It was to show that now, now men have the opportunity to be set free from sin. Now men can be saved. And I cannot help but think that when Jesus said it is finished, that he was referring to that noble fact that you and I now have hope past our wickedness. But I think another thought is worthy of consideration in that statement of it is finished. And that is, he had completed many prophecies regarding his life. It's been estimated that there are over 100 specific prophecies to detail the Messiah, to detail the Christ. Now what is so significant about this is that it just shows the impossibility of just anybody being the Messiah. And it's not like these were just general statements like one day a young woman's going to give birth. That's not, nothing as broad as that. What we have is our God foretold specific things to look for that not just anybody could do. In fact, nobody else could do. Something like this Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Judah. Something as simple as that, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, was profound because it contrasted with Bethlehem of Zebulun, as it talks about in Joshua 19 in verse 15. So the specific location was stated here for the Messiah to come from. Now just to show you just how important this is, how many pieces of information do you need to find one person in this world? I mean, let's just say there's around 7 billion people here. How many pieces of information do you need from that person to find them? Well, generally, if we're going to mail a letter to somebody, we need their name, 
We need their street address. We need their city. We need their state. We need their country. And generally within five pieces of information, we can find anybody. We can get information to anybody. Now think about how difficult it would be to have over 100 items to find in locating a person. And would you have the right person if it took over 100 different facts about them to identify them? Well, that's what Jesus did. And so when he said, it is finished, it is most likely referring to the fact that he had, he had, he had accomplished so many of the prophecies that were stated about him. When he came back from the dead, it says in Luke chapter 24 and verse 27 that beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So that's important. You're not just following somebody who was misled or misguided. When you wear the name of Christ, you're wearing somebody's name who was foretold for hundreds of years, thousands of years prior, that this would be the one. And if he's not the one, then who is it? I read the account one time of a Muslim who was converted to the Lord, and he said that was what, that's what caused him to think differently. As he was reading through Isaiah and all these different specific prophecies regarding the Messiah, he was wondering, well, who else could this be? Who else could be from here and, and be born of a virgin and give himself for the sins of mankind, so on and so forth, all throughout Isaiah? Who else could it be? And he was open-minded enough to realize that it, it narrowed it down. It narrowed it down to one person and one person alone. So it is finished could off, could, could quite often refer to his fulfillment of prophecy. But then finally, it would probably include the thought of what he was already saying the night before he died. And that is, he had finished the earthly work that God had sent him to do in his ministry. That's what he said his work was to do when he started out in John chapter 4, in verse 34. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The night before Jesus died, as he is with his apostles, in John chapter 17, the night before he dies, he says in John chapter 17 and verse 4, in this prayer he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. So what was he talking about? What did he mean by that when he says, I finished your work? And obviously of revealing the Father to the world, this earthly ministry of demonstrating who he was was now done. It's over. And the significance of that, friends, is that there is no reason for Jesus to come back to this earth. I know there are those who are expecting Jesus to come back and set up some earthly kingdom and to do more here that he was unable to do before because men stopped him. But Jesus had a different perspective. He was able to say it's over. There's no reason for him to come back to this earth. His ministry is complete, especially with his kingdom already in existence in the church. The Bible plainly says there's no reason for him to come back, and he's not coming back to this earth. In Hebrews chapter 9, when he comes back, we're going to meet him in the clouds. And the reason that's so is because the, the cost of redemption has already been met. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says in verse 24 that beginning, Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages... He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. There is nothing else for him to do here. It's over. In terms of him manifesting himself in the flesh to carry out his ministry. Doesn't need to happen. He's already paid the debt. There's no reason for him to return. But do you believe that? That God so loved the world that he gave his only son to experience a very painful death 
so that you and I could be set free from sin when we've chosen to violate his will and even offer a salvation while we were yet sinners. Do you understand that? Do you appreciate that? And does that not move you to want to praise the name of the Lord and especially wear the name of the Lord? And I hope it does. Here's what the Bible says. God, it says about Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so do you appreciate that? And if you do appreciate that, will you yield to him in that obedient faith, like our brother even mentioned in his talk? Will we appreciate what our Savior did for us? And like I said, uh, Lord willing, we'll have another opportunity next week to take the Lord's Supper, and I hope these thoughts will still stir your heart then in remembering what Jesus did for you to save you from sin. May God be with us. If you're here, you're not a child of God. I hope you understand that a Savior has died to set you free from sin. But here's the thing. You have to have faith, as we just read. It's to save those who have faith in Him. And if we have faith in Him, then we have to be people who are willing to give our life to Him. It's not enough to call me Lord. You have to do the things that He says. And He wants us to be people who turn away from our sins, make that great confession that he is God's son, and then be buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. That's how he sets people free from sin and we enter the body of Christ. That's how you enter his kingdom. And so we hope you will do that even this day. If you are in need of mercy or prayers or anything we can do for you as God's people, please respond to his invitation as we stand and sing.